threat. Um, so when I started looking for a project to get started with closure and functional programming, I thought graph algorithms would be really fun to implement because they're quite fascinating. So I came across this project called Boom, which was started by Justin Kramer over two years ago, uh, now an active contributor to the project. And um, I really liked the library, so I thought I would just continue with it. Um, I'm Isla Greenberg, and today we'll talk about Loom and Graphs Enclosure. Um, quick overview. So first we'll look at Loom's Graph API. Then we'll look at functional implementation of graph algorithms in Loom. Then we'll look at two consumers of the Loom's API, Titanium Loom and SSA Loom. Titanium is a closure API um, for describing data in a graph database. And SSA is a single, a single static assignment form, which is commonly used by compilers to define, um, to describe the control and data flow uh, of a program. Compiler optimizations are my favorite type of graph prompts, so we'll go into a lot of depth in, for that. All right, so let's get started. Um, first, the Loom's graph API. So there are four types of graphs. Um, are, uh, there are in Loom, there's a basic graph, directed graph, weighted graph, and fly graph, which is a read-only ad hoc data, um, read-only ad hoc graph that is um, <coughs> is able to infer edges from nodes and successors, and it's able to infer nodes and edges from a successor function and a start node. So it makes it very easy for a user to just define their own uh, graph. Now, Loom uses closures protocols, um, which are very similar to Java's interfaces, but have a lot of advantages over Java's interfaces. So protocols require only specification. You don't, the user doesn't need to provide implementation. Information will be provided when the protocol is actually implemented. Now, a single time can implement multiple protocols. So if you have a weighted directed graph, your, your graph will need to implement weighted graph and directed graph protocols. And the advantage of protocols over interfaces is that they can be read to a type at runtime. Whereas interfaces are a design time choice of the type offer, it cannot be sent later. So let's take a look at the actual um, graph API. So we have a protocol graph which has a way to add nodes and edges remove them, read the nodes and edges, determine the membership of them in a graph, as well as it has two functions, successors and out degree. So successors is a function that returns direct successors for a node in a graph. And out degree just counts the number of direct successors for a node. Now, um, you may notice that successor has two arities, G and G node. This is, um, so closure doesn't have current functions, so this is a way to create current functions by um, using one argument and creating the partials, and we'll look at them in a, in a moment. So now another protocol is a die graph, which has predecessors and degree, as well as transpose, uh, which just reverses edges in the graph. The cool thing about transpose is, for instance, um, when you implement a data flow analysis framework, and now you may want to run your analysis backwards and forward, your framework doesn't need to know whether it's running the analysis backward or forward. You just need to transpose the edges, and then you'll just use the generic implementation of the analysis. Now, the last protocol is weighted graph, uh, which just has one function, which returns the weight of an edge. Notice that an edge is defined as a vector of two nodes and one and a two, and that's how we represent them in Loom. Okay, so now let's move on to functional graph algorithms in Loom. There are several of them implemented in Loom, including depth for search and breadth for search, topological sort, which, given a directed acyclic graph, returns a sorting which guarantees that for all the, all the successors of a node n, will come after the node and in the sort. It also has um, single source sorting path um, algorithms, um, including data <coughs> and Bellman-Fort, and we'll look at functional implementation of Bellman-Fort in just a moment. 
strongly connected components using Kasparov's algorithm density, which is defined by ratio of edges to nodes, loner nodes, two coloring, max flow using advanced curve. And the cool thing about Loom is that in our generic namespace, a lot, uh, all the graph algorithms do not require an instance of the graph to be run on. You can just define a successor function and then a SAR function where applicable, and then it will just run those algorithms on it. So let's refresh our memory in Belmont Fort. Um, what Belmont Fort does is um, two things. So it either returns to you a single source shortest path, so from start vertex to all the other vertices, shortest paths, or it is able to detect negative weight cycles that are reachable from the source. And if they are, then you would improve that. So on this graph, you see uh, VDE is uh, a negative weight cycle, which sums up to negative 1. So it's traceable from nodes A, B, D, and E. So we would expect moment 4 would report that. But it, the negative weight cycle is not reachable from node C. So we would expect it would, um, it would just find a path from C to C, which is of distance 0, and then no other vertices reachable from node C. All right, so how would we implement it? What you see here is a Bowman Ford pseudocode uh, taken from CLRS introduction to algorithms. And it uses two functions, initialize single source and relax. And it will look at what they um, execute in a moment. So first let's look at initialize single source, which takes a graph and a start node. And then for each vertex in a graph, it initializes the distance to be positive infinity and the parent pointer to be nil. Parent pointer is defined as, so given the shortest path from source to vertex B, parent pointer is a node that, can't, that is a predecessor of this vertex in that shortest path. All right, so the way we would implement this enclosure is this. So it takes, um, and it estimates is our initialized single source. It takes a graph and a start. Now, we bind our nodes to be all the nodes besides the start node. So we just use center arithmetic disjoint um, to get the nodes. Now, the path costs and paths are the two maps that we'll actually be operating on in our Bowman port. So path costs is a map where the keys are the nodes and the values are distances to that node from the start node. Now, pass is a map where the key is a node and the value is a parent pointer. Now, we also define infinities and nails as convenience to just give us always, or always return to us positive infinity and nail. And we also um, get in init cost and init pass that will just be used to make sure that we have our mapping from all the nodes but the start node to a positive infinity and all the nodes, they are important to be nil. All right. So now, relax edge. Um, relax edge takes two vertices, u and v, and a weight function, which returns to us the distance of the edge between vertices u and v. On a high level, the way you can think about it is, given a path that you found uh, so far to node v, and a path you found to node u, and it is connected to node v through edge uv, if that path is shorter than the one you found before that doesn't go through vertex U, then you can relax the edge. That is, you found a shorter path through vertex U to vertex B from the start node. So what we notice here is that these two conditionals are the same used in two different parts of the um, algorithm. So we will just extract them out to be in their own uh, function. Can relax edge. Um, for those of you not familiar with closure, what you see here is UV as edge is a way to destructure the edge. So we can now refer to edge by the symbol name the edge, as well as we can refer to the two vertices in the edge by their symbol names U and V. And that just makes it more expressive and more succinct to describe it. Now we have our weight, which returns to us uh, distance, and cost, uh, which is our path cost map that maps nodes to distances. So now, what we do is we just get the BD, which is the path, uh, the distance we found so far to node D, and to node B, sorry, and we get UD, which is the distance we found to node U so far, and um, the sum, which is distance 
So node u plus the distance between nodes u and v. And then I'll just return says true if that holds and false if it doesn't hold. So now we'll use this to implement our relaxed edge function, where it takes again u v as edge and then distance and then has path as estimates. Again, it's structuring. So our estimates is a pair of maps. Um, one of them is cast, another one is paths. So now, um, what we all we do is, if we can relax the edge, then we're going to update our cast map and paths map and put it into a vector to construct a new estimate. Otherwise, we'll just return estimates without any updates. So now, on lines three and four, you see for each edge, we relax the edges. So we go over all the edges in the graph and relax them. So in closure, there is a macro four, but it, it, wouldn't, it does this comprehension, but it doesn't do side effects. So instead, what we'll use is we'll use reduce functions. So for those of you, again, not familiar with closure, the double arrow symbol that you see is a thread last macro, which takes a form um, edges g, so edges of the graph, and then puts them as a last argument in the function reduce. So now what we have here is we go, uh, we iterate over all the edges, and then we reduce them and update our estimates map. All right. Now here's tying it all together, going and forth, but don't worry, we'll go look at it uh, in greater detail. All right, so moment for it. It takes a graph and a start node. And now we create our initial estimates um, by calling the init estimates function. Now we will structure the custom paths and relax all the edges. And on line two, you see it goes from one to v minus one. So we want to relax all the edges v minus one times. The way we'll do this functionally is We'll get all the nodes of the graph G, then get the number of those nodes, decrement, so now we have V minus one. And now we'll get the range which returns to us a lazy sequence from zero to V minus one, excluding it. So that would allow us to execute this relaxed edges function V minus one times. Now, for the lines five and six and seven, what we see is if we find any edge that can be relaxed, then we should report immediately that there was a negative weight cycle. So, when we, um, so we'll use uh, closure sum, which returns um, the element itself if a predicate is satisfied on any of the um, elements in the collection, otherwise it returns to us no. And when it returns to us the element itself, that would just evaluate the true. So if we find anything that it, uh, anything is returned by sum, but as soon as it is returned, we'll um, return false. Otherwise, what we're going to do is we'll take the costs, and now we'll also construct the map where the keys are the nodes, and the values are shortest paths. So it's going to be a vector of nodes that allow you to get from the start node to this node. So first we'll get all our pa uh, nodes in the past, which had just all the nodes from the graph. Now we're going to remove all the ones that are unreachable. So we know they were unreachable if we never updated actually distance to them. And so they stayed as positive infinity, and their distance is stayed as positive infinity. Now uh, what we're going to do is we're going to follow pairing pointers to construct the path from source. So we're going to take all the nodes that are reachable from the source, and then what we're going to do is we're going to construct this vector of nodes from the start node to the vertex itself. Great. So now, um, next we'll look at the uh, titanium bloom integration, but before we wrap up, are there any questions about well and forward or bloom graphing the isopore? Okay, great, excellent. So, titanium bloom. So titanium is a project written by ClojureWorks. ClojureWorks is an uh, affiliation of Clojureans who write um, very well documented quality closure libraries. Closure, uh, Titanium is a closure graph library built on top of earliest Titan. And uh, it, uh, it supports various storage backends such as Cassandra, HBase, Berkeley DB. And it does not have graph visualization. So Loom is a graph algorithms and visualization library. 
So I thought it wouldn't be awesome if I could just integrate the two and then visualize the data I have in my graph database and then run graph algorithms on it. So that's what I did. Um, so this is the titanium graph, the way you would define an in-memory graph. And what you see here, right, to this big transaction is the three nodes, A, B, and C, and the three edges, A to B, B to C, and C to A. And now we will have the graph to be the conversion of titanium to loom. So now let's visualize this. We'll visualize it using loom's view function that is already there. So we see here the three nodes, A, B, and C, and then A to B, B to C, and C to A. All right, excellent. So now, how do we do this? So our titanium to loom function, what we'll take is, it will take our titanium graph, and then it would allow the user to specify their own node, edge, and weight functions. The reasoning behind it is that if you have a graph database that does not fit a memory, you may want to provide a query that defines a subset of that graph and to visualize it. So that, a lot, uh, that gives a lot of flexibility for the user of this to um, specify their own subgraph. And now we also provide default implementation, which are the most sanest thing you could possibly want to do. So for no function, all it does is just get all the vertices by default. And then for weight function, it just uh, says constantly one. So that's the ones you saw on the edges. That's the um, weights of the edges. And now edge function. So you see this, um, it uses the juxt, which is a function combinator of the two functions, tail vertex and head vertex. And then that is applied on to get all the edges. So the way to think about this is it gets all the edges, and now what it's going to return to us is a collection of vectors. Each vector is um, a vector of two elements that has a head vertex and a tail vertex. So that is done to conform to our loom's representation of an edge, which is a vector of two vertices and one and a two. Okay. So now, now what we we'll define? Yes. Sorry, just a quick question. Yeah. Does get all edges actually comes up a list of all the edges? Uh, sorry. Does it actually comes up a list of all the edges? Um, if you just use loom uh, titaniums. No, okay. just what you call get all edges. Oh, get all edges. Are you actually generating a list of all the edges? Uh, yes. Okay, because yeah. that can be expensive. Right, right, right yeah. Um, Isn't it lazy though? So we could make it lazy, yes. Okay. Yeah, that would be better. Yeah. Um, so now. So now we'll implement actually the Loom's protocols. So in Clojure, you use Refi, which is a macro, to create a runtime and objects that implements all these protocols, and it does not have internal state. So now we just implement the nodes, edges, has nodes, all these functions. The interesting one to look at is um, remember our discussion of current functions and closures? So this is how we create one. So then next time we call successors, <coughs> G, we just need to provide just one argument. Um, so now, successors G node. Um, this is an interesting one because, so we get the um, node, and now uh, we get the, we use titanium's uh, function, connected out vertices, which will return to us all the vertices connected to this node. Now we're going to put it into a lazy sequence because that would just be better, more efficient for us. So now what we want to do is, if the user did not um, did not include all the nodes, we want to make sure we, when we run our graph algorithms on our graph, we don't uh, um, we don't look at all the successes of the node, only the ones that the user decided to include into the loom graph. So it also implements a die graph protocol and uh, weighted graph protocol. These are pretty straightforward. So, um, sorry, before we move on to our SSA to loom integration, are there any questions about this? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So, um, this can handle infinite graphs? No. No? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Just, yeah. just as reference to help our school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, you mentioned what the representation of edges was, but what's the representation of nodes, both in general and with titanium? Okay, so in titanium, nodes are, I believe, are just object nodes that are returned, and then um, in loom, it's just whatever it is, it's just anything. And anything that has like value, like value equality. Uh, it has what, sir? Like value equality. 
Uh, yeah, you can have it. It's whatever you put into a collection. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Um, yes? You talked about visualization. Uh -huh. Do you have a picture? Or oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. This one. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and then there's also very easy to tinker with it and, um, in Bloom and decide that you want to actually portray you know, what the relationship between these two nodes are instead of wait if you decide to. You just define a different function and you'll get different data from your titanium graph. All right. Now let's look at SSA. So a single static assignment form is produced by Core Async. Core Async is a library um, that was implemented by Closure Core Team. Um, it uh, allows us to program asynchronously with Closure. It is generated by parse state machine function um, in the most recent, in the version I'm using. It may be changing the API in the future, but um, it's what I have so far. So basically what it does is this function takes an arbitrary piece of closure code, and now um, in this example it is um, plus x1 to y, and now it gets compared with zero, and if uh, the result is true, then we add one to x and return that value, otherwise we return, uh, add two to x and return that value. So that returns to us this blob of data that is very tricky to understand, unless you spend hours trying to internalize it and understand it. So, what we're going to do is we're going to strip out only the necessary uh, pieces of it, and then it will return to us something like this. So now here you see a map where the keys are basic blocks, and the values are a vector of instructions in that basic block. All right. So now let's visualize this. So we, again, we just use loom's view, and then we um, call the SSA to loom function, which will allow us to convert from a stat form to our loom representation. And we get something like this. For those of you who can't see from the back, um, so we see our vertices as being basic blocks. Each basic block adds a, a conditional, non-conditional uh, jump, or when a program execution stops. So now this is the entry point of the um, program. So we have plus x1 to y function, and now we compare with zero, and then we compare the result of that comparison, and if it's true, then we go on the left-hand side, add x uh, to one, and return that result. Otherwise, we add x to two, and return that result. And then on the bottom, the basic block you see is the result of the conditional statement. So for those of you who do know um, single, uh, about single static assignment form, it's the fee function. So it combines the results of all the paths preceding it, and it represents that. Okay, so this is much easier, in my opinion, to visualize a program flow, and you can actually understand and see what's going on. And then when you're writing compiler optimizations, you can actually verify visually whether your optimization was implemented correctly, and it does what you think it does. because. We're so good at visually inspecting things and um, reasoning about them. All right. So now, how do we do this? We're not going to go into detail. It was very, very easy for me to convert that into our loom representation. But we'll just look at some of the interesting pieces of how I converted it. One of them is um, this delay function that you see. So delay function in Clojure takes a form and then returns a delay object, which will execute the form when the <coughs> execution is forced. So the reason why I'm doing this like this here is that if we have a node function and an edge function, but we don't want to be executing every time we want to do something with edges on nodes. So the guarantee I have here is that it's going to execute zero one times, and no more than that, and it will catch the result after it executed. So now the rest of it is, um, so you see this um, graph keywords? So what I'm doing here is I'm separating my loop representation from the rest of the blob of the SSA representation because I wanted to leave unmodified so I can do more modifications on it later. Now the add sign we see here on nodes and edges, what that does is it actually forces the execution. So when the um, user of the API decides to get the nodes, then that's when it will try to uh, it would actually execute the node function and edge function. All right. So 
And then the other keyword you see here, data SSH, it will just put all that blob to be accessible to us by the data keyboard. Excellent. So now we have our SSH form. We have a way to represent that uh, in Loom. Let's do something with it. So um, what I implemented is a data flow analysis framework. So data flow analysis um, framework is uh, data flow analysis in general is defined by the following. So for each basic sorry. So for each basic block, um, we have our in value for the basic block is going to be a result of joining all the out values of its predecessors. And now our out value will be a result of a transfer function on the in value on the basic block. So what we need is initialization function to define what basic blocks are initially, join function, and transfer function. And we keep solving this system of equations until we reach a fixed point. And I use a word list approach in my framework um, to figure out what we reach. A fixed point is just when the work list is empty, so there's no more work to be done. All right, so let's look at it. It's an implementation. Are there any questions so far about the conversion or SSA or data flow analysis? No? Okay, excellent. So our data flow analysis just has four keys that need to be provided. Start, graph, join, and transfer. Notice that I do not have the initialization function. The reason for that is I can just use closures nail to define that this basic block has not been evaluated. So no matter what function I use to actually define the values, whether I'm using lattices, nail could be the bottom or top, depending on your definition of the lattice of flow. Um, all I know is that nail is when the basic block has not been evaluated yet. All right, so now what I have here is a start node, and I, this is a, a convenient way for me to make sure it's in a set. And um, you may encounter that some data flow analysis require many start nodes. And uh, for instance, for backwards analysis, you may have different paths that the program could have taken, and now you want to run it backwards. So you want to take all the possible ends of the program and then run the uh, um, analysis backwards. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the loop recur to do this recursively. So what we're doing is we're initializing out values to be an empty map. And out values is the result that we're going to return at the end. That's the result that analysis produced to us. Now, we just structure node and work list so that we have quick access to our node that we're actually going to be operating, which is the basic block. And the work list, the rest of it, that we'll um, take care of after we are done with our basic block. So now our in value is the result of applying join function on out values of predecessors. And you see this map V, all that does is just it um, puts the result of map into the vector. And now out value is defined by the result of um, executing a transfer on node and in value. And we have our update question mark function. So what that allows us to know is whether we need to process its successors and there has been some change so we have not uh, reached the fixed point yet. So oh, the way you define it is if the new out value that we just calculated is different from the one we calculated previously, that means that we need to keep running this analysis. So now, if update happened, then we just make sure that we update our out values map with a newly calculated value. Otherwise, we just return it as is. Now, for work list, if an update happened, that means we need to put all the successors of a node into our work list to be processed later. Otherwise, we just return the work list as is. And now the last part, so seek work list is um, this closure way of figuring out if the collection is empty or not. So what it will return is, if, there is, if it's not empty, then it will just return an element, which will evaluate to true. Otherwise, we return nail, which will uh, evaluate to false. So now, if the work list is not empty, we just want to keep processing the work list and the out value, uh, and to keep updating the out values. Otherwise, we know we've reached the fixed point. So we just want to return our out values, and we're done with our analysis, with running our analysis. Okay, so let's 
actually use this. Um, let's actually write a data flow analysis that uses this framework. So what I define here is global CC, which uses the availability expressions analysis. So an expression, so suppose you have two paths going into the basic block, and expressions A, B, and C are available on one path, and expressions A and C are available on the other path. Then what you have available at the current basic block is expressions A and C, but not B, because it was not available on the other path, so it couldn't, it's not available to when we merge it. So what we define here is we define a uh, structural graph and node data to um, from our SSA to loom representation. Now we get our start block from the start block SSA, which is just what you get in the that block, which is the entry point to the program. So now what we're doing here is we define the the two functions: join function and the transfer function. And also I'm defining here the pure function. So we only want to look at instructions that are pure functions. Um, we only want to look at expressions that are pure functions, so this is just a way to do this. Um, now, for our joint function, we, decide, uh, we know that the way we join them is we need to do set intersection on them. So A, B, and C was available on one, A and C was available on the other path. Now the set intersection will give us A and C. And um, if you remember, I defined initial value for all the unevaluated block, uh, basic blocks to be nil. So now here, I'm, if my predecessors have not been evaluated for some reason, then uh, what I'm going to return is just a empty set to get around it. So now transfer function just takes a node and an in value, and then what it does is it takes uh, so no data on a node. What that does is it returns to us instructions in the basic block. Now we're going to uh, filter for those that are pure functions, and then we're going to take out the rest, which is in the SSA representation. Rest is how you specify the function itself, so we're just going to take out the actual expression. Now what we're going to do is, you see here into, so what into does is it takes everything on the right hand side and puts it into the left hand side. So we take all the pure function instruction in this basic block, and then we put it into our in value. And now that produces us our out value for the basic block. Okay, so now we have everything we need. We have our start node, we have our graph, we have we defined our um, join function and we defined our transfer function. So we can just use the data flow analysis as is. Notice that this letter fed, what we did is we closed over, um, for this algorithm, closed over this function. So we used all the, the loom, uh, all the SSA specific data inside this. So data flow analysis framework can be used um, to do region definitions analysis, blindness analysis that is used by dead code elimination, available expressions, which we just did, uh, constant propagation. But compilers are not, they're not, not the only application for data flow analysis frameworks. There are applications for it in social networks. For instance, if you wanted to calculate an Erdosh number for yourself, <laughs> what you would define is you define that a value, out value for Erdosh is zero, and now if we're in an alternate universe and we have multiple Erdoshes, you would just put them all as start nodes, all to be zero. Now our transfer function is going to be is going to be a minimum of all the people I'm connected to. So if I'm connected to somebody who is degree one removed from Erdosh, I only am degree two removed from, uh, from Erdosh, even if I know somebody else who is degree eight removed from Erdosh. And also our um, transfer function is gonna be just incrementing the value. So if somebody I'm connected to is degree one removed, I'm going to be degree two removed, naturally. And another application is a spread of information systems. For instance, data analysis is one of the applications. So um, to sum it up, um, I had a lot of fun implementing um, graph algorithms functionally. I find it very intuitive uh, to implement them functionally 
because it was very natural to me to think about how, given an input, your function will do some processing transformations and then produce output, which was later used by some other function, and so on. The thing that I found uh, challenging is the mental overhead. So for those of us coming maybe from object-oriented programming, when you define a node as an object or an edge as an object that contains two nodes, um, it's very easy to think of them as nodes and, ob uh, nodes and edges. In this case, we just have collections, sequences, maps, and vectors, and we just operate them without really any concern for whether we keep, stick to the semantics of nodes and edges. It is up to the developer to give So, um, the reason I had, uh, I decided to try out different applications that will use Lotus API is that a couple months ago, uh, there was a discussion on closure mailing list about graph APIs, about improving existing graph APIs, and there are a lot of really fantastic ideas floating around, like making distinction between mutable and mutable graphs, having additional features on the graph, or allowing metadata to be defined on each node on each edge. Those are all great ideas, but the problem is it's very tricky to know just exactly how much or how little you should add to, a, to your graph API to be able to use it. So what I decided to do is I decided I'm going to have to consumers and see just how far I can take the existing very generic graph API. So that brings me to um, two questions. How general should a graph API be? So, so far, Loom has worked out great for me. I was able to get around a lot of the quirks for SSA. I just put everything else into a different keyword, and I was still able to use uh, Loom. And all graph-specific data is, uh, can be closed over by graph-specific algorithms like we saw in our global CIC. So we just defined join and transfer and then closed over to get the no data, which were the instructions in a basic block. Now, how featured should a graph API be? A lot of graph problems are uh, solved using domain-specific um, algorithms which are not easily transferred to other domains. Like if I want to run compile optimizations, I'm probably never going to use Bowman forwards or Dijkstra. Same way, probably a lot of compile optimizations are never going to be useful. At the same time, the data flow analysis framework that I just implemented is very generic. It doesn't care whether you're operating on a SSA form or you're operating on your social networking graph. All it does is it just takes that graph. It knows how to access its successors and predecessors in order to turn to your values, as long as you provide your own implementation of transfer and join functions. So it could also be used, like we discussed, um, to get Erdos number to tint analysis. Now, is it even possible to have a generic graph library that is useful for everybody, for a lot of various applications? so that the user of the, the graph library doesn't need to provide implementation for things that the graph doesn't even have. Like if I have a social network graph and then I need to provide how, what basic instructions it has in that scope, it would be very annoying to have to tiptoe around it. At the same time, if a graph a library doesn't have enough, then the user would just find it frustrating because they have to implement most of it. So, I'm still trying to figure out how to exactly have enough features so that the graph library is useful, and at the same time, it's not forcing the user to conform their graphs to this graph library's presentation. That is it for today, and um, now I'll take any questions you might have. Thank you. When you showed the drawn graphs, um, uh -huh. who's actually drawing them and how are they drawn and uh -huh. how is that done? Yeah, yeah, so it uses graphics, um, so it produces dot files, and then, okay. um, yeah. okay. and then um, there are functions you can define to exactly how to render them. For instance, like in, um, let's see, in, I think we just it. Um, you saw the um, basic blocks had this, you know, vector of, instructions in it, so like how exactly you want to render those is like something you can just define. But, yeah. mm -hmm. yep. is, are the slides going to be available later? Uh, yeah, yeah, oh. yeah, I'll post them. Mm -hmm.
Any other questions yet? So like, I guess like, um, how does this compare and defer to say a graph database like Neo4j? So this is not a graph database. What it is is algorithms and viewing them, visualizing them. So it would not store any, it, well, it's stored in memory. Right. And then if you want to go beyond, then what you would have to do is you would probably use you know, titanium or something and then have a way to put it into memory, but only part of it. So how would you treat sparse graphs and dense graphs uh, differently or it does it uh, behind the scenes? Uh, so behind the scenes it will be the same, but you know that brings me to the whole um, thought of do you need to distinguish them? Is that something that the user can do on their own end and not have it included? Or is it very important that a graph library should have different representations and then the user just specifies whether it's sparse or dense? So if any of you have ideas or experiences, have thoughts on this, let me know. Oh yeah, perfect. Well, you have four or five representations out of the box, and then you let the user build their own representations with your building works. But then that takes some amount of work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the idea is, you know, the trade-off is what this graph library has to offer so that they do the conversion, or they are already building their own representation, so do they even need to use this graph library if they were to have their own representation? The protocol is pretty easy to implement, so. Sorry? The protocol looked pretty small and easy to implement. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It took me, what's like 20, maybe 30 minutes at most, you know, by doing this as like first project in Clojure to actually integrate Titanium with Loom or integrate the SSA with Loom, so. It's uh, pretty straightforward. Like, that's one of the advantages of Loom is that it's very easy to integrate right now. And if you want the features that Loom has to offer, then um, you can yeah, no, have a bridge. Oh. Yeah. Do, you, do you have any plans with your your uh, SSA analysis? I, I know that that Tim, who uh, Tim Baldrige, who made the SSA stuff for Corollar Async mm -hmm. was running uh, like live li liveness analysis and other things via data log with with uh, Datomic. Are, are, are you interested in like actually maybe helping optimize closure programs this way or? Yeah, yeah, actually. So my one of my areas of interest is in compiler optimization. So um, and when I started looking at integrating SSA form and writing optimizations. I think that would be really fun to do, and then have it um, so have a closure representation in closure, run all the uh, optimizations, and then be able to port that to anything else and target anything else you want. Yeah. So one recommendation I have yeah. gets back to my other question about yeah, yeah. efficiency. Right. Is to just provide map engines and map vertices function. Mm -hmm. It's actually right to my um, okay. class based graph API. Uh -huh. um, I, mean, I generate graphs with millions of edges and causing up a list of million edges just isn't realistic, you know. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really good suggestion. Thanks, yeah. I think so far performance hasn't been really um, a concern yet because, well, we only have two consumers ever. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if you, if any of you have actual projects that could use this and then we could uh, talk about how to optimize it. But I'm more of a fan of not optimizing until I actually need it because sometimes people get overly excited and then they spend most of the time optimizing for something they don't yeah. even know it should be optimized. I mean, well, this but isn't yeah. really optimizing. Yeah. This is just providing a way of yeah. reaching every edge without actually generating a list of all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go back and think that, yeah. Um, and I guess one more comment. Uh -huh. uh, when, I was, when I was toying with my implementation, I was kind of torn between uh, space and memory requirements. I mean, I'm um, time and, and versus spatial requirements. Uh -huh. And you know, like in, in algorithms, there you know, there's, there's two extreme representations for graphs. Right. And you see adjacency list, and that gives you like minimum space requirements, but edge retrieval is really expensive. Right, right. Or you go with the adjacency matrix representation, which gives you constant time edge retrieval, but tons of space. So mm -hmm. I actually settled on an implementation of sparse matrices, okay. to, uh, which is somewhere in between the two, um, to actually not have my graphs take up too much room um, and still have edge retrieval when we, you know, reasonably fast. Okay, okay, thanks, yeah, that's good to know, thanks, yeah.
yeah. So maybe you already answered this with your response to optimization. Um, did you um, experiment with using transients at all when implementing your algorithms? I mean, you, you have a little snippet there of kind of the um, textbook definition of uh, Bellman cord. Um, uh -huh. Obviously, that's often in terms of arrays and useful data structures and so on. Right. And closure is by, s by default offering you persistent data structures. Did you experiment at all with useful data structures? Uh, not yet, but that's definitely something I've considered. Yeah. But um, you should you should mention that you don't really have to because you have it for free in many places. So you are doing a lazy application of a SOS, uh, and a SOS internally will use uh, conj bang and, uh, and transient. So when she was like looping over the entire, you mean into? Like in, into will do that as a SOS not internally. I think if you use the variadic SOS, either one, she was using into. So she had she was using a couple of core functions that do that internally. Okay. So she was so not everywhere, but in many places she was getting that for free. Yeah, that's definitely a good point, though, you know, going back and thinking about just how much more compact you could get with it and using better functions to do this, as opposed to just the first thing that comes to mind using whatever function gets you there. So, yeah, that will definitely be the next stages. So, we do fly graphs, you could very easily implement it in the graphs, right? Yeah. And you're not that far away from being able to do that. So. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yes, there, there, I did a, a little bit of looking a few months ago. And there's a literature on functional data structures for graphs. Is that something you've touched on at all? I have not. Uh, could you maybe post about it? I'll see if I can. The, yeah. yeah, thanks. Uh, do you remember what the author was? I'll have to look. Okay, all right, thanks. Yeah. We have seen books on data structures for functional programming and functional data structures. But graphs usually are not treated. Right. Oh, right. There, there isn't a, a canonical way of doing graphs, right? Right, right? But there has been some work in there. Uh, that would be really interesting to look at, yeah. Thanks. Uh, yep. Yeah. So, uh, I couldn't understand much of the last part. Uh, I'm not very familiar with the compilers. But once you did uh, like the last part, the SSH stuff, so uh, it kind of looks like uh, Excel to me, like where you have to, like, Formulas being fed to each other. Uh, so, is it any way like once you make that SSH stuff, is there any library on which you can execute like point the point the point and people can see like what so the value is in between? Yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, I don't think I. Uh, right. could you Maybe I don't yeah. So, like once you have the graph, uh -huh. so it has like whatever this depends on this and the whole dependency thing is there. Now, can you single step through it? So, you want algorithm animation? You want, you want to animate the algorithm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's actually another thing that is on the to-do list. I think that would be really cool because it's it would make it also easier to debug when you write. Yeah, more actually, uh, why? Uh, because uh, I write accounting software. Uh -huh. <laughs> I literally write them. And the problem is most of my time, like most of the work I do is I take like Excel spreadsheets from accountants and convert it to like maybe code. Uh, so the thing is, like if I have something like this, a lot of times what happens is it's so complicated, like uh, you still have to maintain spreadsheets to exactly figure out which point, like if a value is coming out incorrect, you have to like exactly go back to Excel and debug it. Like there's no way to actually debug it, right? Just to say. And then you have to use a programmer. But if you have something like this where they can exactly see like with this point, like in the flow, this is in the whole data flow. Right. Like this, this particular stuff got wrong. So they can actually, this year was wrong, mm -hmm. then they can say, oh, fine. Mm -hmm. And then they can. Oh. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. The one thing I was thinking about doing, you know, along the lines of what you suggested is having like, a way to step. So everything you tell it to, you know, run it 10 iterations or something, and then it pauses. And then that's how you get the feedback of where you might have gone wrong. And having like this finer grained control of. So is this something like it is standardized? Like, is there anything that we are using to take? Or is there some to be able to do that, uh, I don't know of anything that exists already. But um, yeah. Is there any um, desire or uh, um, intention in the mood to actually develop graphs that you can graphically interact with? Did you do what's right? Graphically interact with. Graphics I mean, graphics is great, but it gives you yeah, a yeah. graph you can't do it. Yeah. Um, 
a few people have suggested different visualization libraries that would basically allow them to then modify the internal representation, uh, internal structure, and modify those through a UI or something. Um, that's a very interesting direction to take, it, definitely. So um, I'm not quite sure yet uh, if I'm going to be that way, or right now I am really enjoying doing the data flow analysis and the compiler and stuff. But if any of you are interested, that's definitely something that would be really cool to have. Uh, regarding the question that was raised about functional, uh, well, functional algorithms for graph databases, I mean, my understanding is once you get beyond a certain size of graph where, say, matrices are not efficient, you know, thousand nodes or million nodes or whatever, linked lists is pretty much the standard way to do it, and that is sort of the functional data structure. Okay. You know, yeah, but retrieval is really expensive. Edge retrieval becomes very expensive because you've got to traverse the list on the edge. Yeah. And that's the advantage of matrix representation. It's kind of like two extremes in spectrum. Well, there, it's right. There are two extremes. My understanding, though, is I mean, I, there are probably certain places where linked lists are going to work. But, um, right, so then you start looking at hybrid scale. structures. Sorry? Then you start looking at hybrid structures where you're indexing the lists. Mm -hmm. So you can do that kind of look up. I mean, she already has two, so like she's using sets, which are sorted like tree maps, right, internally. So she's just using a pair of sorted tree maps. Yeah. yeah that's an interesting thought. I have not spent any time at all thinking about this, so all your suggestions are very welcome. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you so much.